For the next 30 minutes, I'm going to share with you the very basics of basics of traumatic brain injury. Uh, I've spent about 25 years studying head trauma, so either there's not much to learn and I'm really stupid, or, or I'm just going to kind of distill it down to what's really necessary, what not to miss. Okay, so I'm going to do this via 10 cases. There, there are some characteristic diagnoses that we see with, uh, with head injury that are kind of recurrent themes in, in traumatic brain injury. And so I'm going to go through these 10 cases. Okay, simple. This guy's found down, you have a CT. What's the diagnosis? What can you do to make it, the diagnosis easier? So you just widen the window. Very simple. And basically you're looking at a narrow window width and you see that it looks like the skull's thicker on one side than on the other side. You're looking for evidence of scalp injury because that show, shows you that the patient in fact hit their head. That, in, that's the coup site. And then in the contra coup site, that's where the vast majority of stuff happens. Um, and that's a subdural hematoma. Just your classic acute subdural hematoma. So to refresh your memory on the anatomy, three meningeal layers, the pia, the arachnoid, and the dura, which is a bilayered structure that forms the fox and the tentorium. Okay, so the fox and the tentorium are composed of the two layers of the dura. And the two layers of the dura are, are closely adherent to each other other than at the dural sinuses. So the venous sinuses, suprasagittal sinus, for example, is just formed by the two layers of the dura where they split from each other, as you can see on this diagram, if I can get my mouse to go, there we go there. And so when you have a um, epidural hematoma, which is essentially the only thing that really routinely happens at the coup site, uh, it's above the outer dural layer. And when you have a subdural hematoma, it's beneath the inner dural layer. Okay, so that's just basic anatomy in case you get asked questions on that. So the characteristic findings of a subdural hematoma are it stops at the midline because it can't go past the fox. It crosses the sutures, as you can see in this past specimen. You do not see the dura because it's beneath the dura, right? So you can see that this holohemispheric collection of methemoglobin here is abutting the surface of the brain parenchyma. There's no black line that you see if it were in the epidural space. It's frequently crescent-shaped, and as I said, the vast majority are in the contra coup site. Now, there are a couple findings in a subdural hematoma that are particularly ominous that you should be aware of. When it's heterogeneous like this, it's particularly concerning because that may mean that it's active bleeding. It may also mean that it's just re-bleeding into a pre-existing chronic subdural hematoma, but uh, if there's disproportionate mass effect, if the lesion's a little bit convex, and if you see associated subarachnoid hemorrhage, these are four findings of a subdural hematoma that portend a, a worse prognosis. Case two. Uh, case two show, it makes one particular point, and that is that when you see an epidural, co epidural collection now, not subdural, which is at the coup site, which tends to be lentiform, which the majority are associated with skull fractures, and epidurals do not cross sutures, okay, so they're just the opposite of subdurals. You can see low density areas in an epidural that, that can predict active expansion. So here you see this little guy, and he developed right-sided pupillary dilatation and ptosis, and you can see the active expansion. So when you see the past specimens of a different patient just showing the clot on top of the dura, and you can see the, the brain peeking out beneath the dura, here. So the point of this slide is that when you see low density areas in an epidural hematoma, that's called the swirl sign. Basically, you have to get on the phone and call some, the neurosurgeon because that generally indicates active, uh, active hemorrhage. Okay, case three. This is a favorite case. It's shown all the time. And this is, of course, the isodense subdural hematoma. So what, what do we see here in this case? Well, let me show you this case with just some with, with some annotation. So if you look at the gray-white junction, the gray-white differentiation, you can see that it's displaced medially. So if we look at this scan, we can see that the sulci are effaced. We can see that so-called thick cortex, in other words, the isodense subdural mimics the density of the parenchyma, underlying gray matter. And so that's called buckling of the white matter, where the subcortical U fibers are kind of just buckled and, and uh, displaced together. Now, sometimes contrast can help, but of course, MR is, is going to facilitate this diagnosis. So one more chance on this diagnosis, because it is a favorite. 
you have this guy who's got altered mental status, and you look at it and you say, well, you know, the left lateral ventricle is a little bit effaced, but I don't really see anything, and even though contrast has been administered, nothing's really definite. So you do the MR, and clearly the, the uh, extraaxial collection presents itself. So if you don't diagnose, this is just kind of just basic daily practice, if the CT, CT doesn't make the diagnosis, and indeed there's a neurological event, then, then go on to MR. This case makes a couple important points. I'm sure you're probably going to hear it again this morning during the neuro session. So this is a contrast-enhanced CT scan. And you can see that there is a ring-enhancing lesion in the left frontal lobe with some edema and a ring-enhancing lesion in the right frontal lobe. We know those contrasts because we can see the vena galen and internal cerebral veins here and just vasculature. You have this differential for a ring-enhancing lesion. In this case, it's bilateral ring-enhancing lesions. And remember that mnemonic, the magic doctor, well, Contusion or hematoma, conglomeration of contusions, has to be in that uh, differential. So here's the same patient with MR. And what do we see? Well, we see something going on in the orbital frontal lobe on the right. We see this black, thin ring around this lesion, which tells us that it's a hemorrhage, although abscesses, too, can have a, a black rim. Um, but this is the uh, hemosiderin ring, and you look for other injuries. And here you can see that there's not only classic trauma locations. I mean, this is this is trauma real estate when you're talking about the orbital frontal lobes. Uh, this is this is really uh, tr uh, the the most common area for traumatic brain injury. And you can also see that there's a little subdural uh, hematoma as well. So a ring enhancing lesion, whether it's on the boards or whether it's in real life. It's, yes, it could be a metastasis. Yes, it could be a primary you know, brain tumor. But think about trauma, uh, subacute trauma, where there's actually uh, uh, enhancement uh, due to the breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. Now, the contusion, in, co in distinction to the hematoma, is really a bruise of the surface of the brain. And it's due to the fact that the skull has some intrinsically rough areas. And so when the brain accelerates and decelerates and rubs across those irregular surfaces, it bruises the gyral crest, okay? Now they can become confluent and form a, a hematoma, but uh, it's this irregularity of the skull surface that results in these bruises. And therefore, MR is gonna be far better than CT because of the beam hardening artifact that we get with uh, CT. You should be familiar with the coup contra coup uh, entity mechanism, and even though it's a little bit controversial, Basically, what you have is when, for example, you fall on the ice, you hit the back of your head, what happens is pressure gradients form within your brain due to the deformation inside the skull, such that positive pressure gradients are at the coup site and negative pressure gradients form at the contra coup site. The brain doesn't like negative pressure gradients and it undergoes microcavitation. At the same time, the brain is pulling away from the inner table of the skull, and so you get a combination of findings when patient then when the brain is now static and you end up with a, a um, you know a coup site with a fracture frequently with an epidural and notice how the diagram shows <clears throat> displacement of the sagittal sinus and you end up with a subdural in the contra coup location and you end up with intraparenchymal hematomas so that's the coup contra coup coup at the site of impact contra coup where the brain injury uh, tends to occur so here's just an example the coup site defined by the scalp soft tissue swelling and has the epidural hematoma the contra coup site which is 180 degrees opposite is where the contusion, hematomas, subarachnoid, the, the majority, and the subdurals tend to occur, okay? So what is this case? Kind of nonspecific appearance, you have multiple subcortical white matter lesions, hemorrhagic lesions, and they've got a little bit of edema, and of course the history is gonna be key here. You know, if, if this was a high-speed MVA, then you'd, one would think about diffuse axonal injury. Uh, if this were not a high-speed MVA, you'd have to think about the other causes of multiple subcortic white matter hemorrhagic in injuries, such as septic emboli or metastases, melanoma specifically, hemorrhagic metastases. When we think about diffuse axonal injury, and we're not really comfortable with the term DAI, um, that's going to be changing over the next few years because it's not always diffuse. Uh, and it's not just the axons. If this is a, a fluoro jade green stain of neurons and their axons, and you can see how fragile they are, so you can see how we're going to underestimate the true extent of brain injury when things get sheared. 
So shearing injury is, is referring to this rotational injury to the brain, not a strict front-back impact. And it's graded into three, form, three types, grade one, grade two, grade three. Grade one is the most common, and it involves the lobar white matter. And as you can see here on this T2-weighted image, in a patient who's a victim of abuse, several months down the line, we have these little black dots consistent with ferritin and, and uh, hemosiderin-laden macrophages stuck in that white matter. If you do specialized sequences, and gradient's not even that specialized, if you do susceptibility-weighted sequences, and some people are doing that, but you don't need to know SWI imaging for the, for, for the boards, but I think in real life it is going to play more of a role. SWI, or susceptibility-weighted imaging, is kind of a gradient echo on steroids. It's just particularly sensitive to magnetic susceptibility. So anything that leaves blood in its, in its, in its wake, such as amyloid angiopathy, for example, or diffuse hemorrhagic axonal injury. SWI and gradient sequences are particularly good. Now, grade two, DA, grade two DAI, or grade two shearing injury, involves the corpus callosum, and these patients are more severely injured. Okay, low bar white matter patients, they may be okay. They may walk out of the hospital that day, even though you've diagnosed a hemorrhagic shearing injury. So there's a whole kind of change in consciousness going on with traumatic brain injury now. The colossal injury is typically the splenium. Here you see a very bulbous T1-weighted splenium. And here on T2 sagittal images, you can see that actually there's a little rind of sparing in the back of the splenium, the central fibers of the splenium. So it's not a direct contusion. It's not a guillotine against the back of the splenium. It's really more shearing forces when the, when the brain gets uh, translational um, move. And the reason the splenium is because is injured is because the falx is there. And the falx, which is Latin for sickle, is a sickle-shaped structure that is narrow anteriorly and broad posteriorly. So you can see that posteriorly the falx abuts the splenium and therefore the shearing forces when the brain is moved side to side are greater posteriorly uh, than anteriorly. And then the, th the final triad member is is a shearing injury of the brain stem. So grade one is lobar white matter, grade two is corpus callosum, and grade three is the dorsolateral rostral brain stem. And the higher the grade, the worse the mechanism, the worse the prognosis, okay? The deeper the lesion, the worse the prognosis. And here's a little guy who you could see a little focus of methemoglobin in the gray-white junction. So this isn't a contusion, okay? This is not a contusion. It's not at the surface of the brain. It's not a gyral crest injury. This is at the junction of the gray-white matter. And you can see there's one in the spleen in his corpus callosum and also in his, uh, in his midbrain as well. And in that case, the CT was negative. And it's not surprising that CT was negative when you have these small little punctate uh, shearing injuries. Which test is best for shearing injury? Well, a, a lot of them are taken together, basically. We use all of these together. T2, flare, gradient sequencing, DWI in the acute setting, not the chronic setting, just like with stroke, DWI is only good for a certain period of time in the acute uh, phase. Diffusion tensor imaging, you're not going to be asked about unlikely uh, for boards, and actually even in real life community practice, we'd, it's not quite ready for prime time. So, you know, there, DTI will be here. It is, it is here for those of us that are doing research on it, but it's really not quite ready for prime time yet. But it's diffusion tensor imaging and the, the fractional anisotropy that goes along with it will uh, will be in the future. This is a T2-weighted image showing a lesion of the splenium the corpus callosum. This pa same patient had some areas of susceptibility on their coronal GRE images, indicative of shearing injury. The DWI shows the typical light bulb injury associated with that uh, acute lesion to the splenium the corpus callosum that shows uh, on the apparent diffusion coefficient, you can show that it's dark and not due to T2 shine through. And then the flare image shows the lesion in the splenium of the corpus callosum. And also subtle but present is areas of the white matter abnormality that are shown to be hemorrhagic on the GRE. So we're kind of using all of them uh, together. What does this patient have? I threw this case in here because it's something, you, you want to take your blinders off when you're dealing with any case, in, in whether it's trauma or tumor or whatever. We have areas of hemorrhage. We can see these right frontal hemorrhagic areas in the subcortical white matter. We also see something in the parietal subcortical white matter also hemorrhagic. But what you also see in this case, and when you're thinking about the differential diagnosis of white matter hemorrhagic areas, uh, you want to look at the uh, sinuses as well because ven hemorrhagic venous infarcts 
will also mimic, depending upon their size, some shearing injuries. And you can, also, you can have them together. I mean, patients with trauma get venous sinus thrombosis. That's one of the risk factors for sinus thrombosis is, is trauma. So the typical signs that we see with sinus thrombosis, and I think Max is going to, Max may cover this in his talk next, but is the empty delta sign. Notice how, how swollen this is too, how round this clot is, and then the enhancement around it. And you can see that this may be a shearing injury or a septic emboli mimic. Here's a venous hemorrhagic uh, uh, stroke, as we can see in the subcortical white matter. The whole brain looks a little swollen. I mean, you look at this, and there's preservation of the gray-white differentiation, but there are no sulci. So this is actually venous hypertension, okay, where there's kind of a boggy brain where blood can't get out because of the obstruction to the dural sinuses. And so the brain is kind of swollen. Just think about that. And you'll, this is a favorite diagnosis of, I mean, it's, it's, it's a commonly misdiagnosis in practice, and it's a treatable diagnosis, and it's also a favorite diagnosis of the boards. And here you can just see the typical T1 sag with the methemoglobin in the superior sagittal sinus, and then the MRV showing the asymmetric flow-related enhancement in the transverse sinus. I threw this one in here too, um, because again, keeping those blinders off, I think, is important. This is an elderly guy, and what you're seeing here are multiple hemorrhagic lesions. You've got one big hematoma here, and you have all these little guys, black punctate areas that were reminiscent of that prior uh, DAI case that I showed you in the, uh, in the, in the, in the child. And the, this is a case of cere cerebral amyloid angiopathy. So when, you're, when you see multiple subcortical hemorrhagic lesions, yes, it may be DEI, but, but it could also be cerebral amyloid angiopathy. Obviously, the patient's age is a key, and the patient's history is, is going to be a key. Another favorite diagnosis is the uh, uh, child abuse, uh, non-accidental trauma. Here is an eight-month-old, and you get this kind of disproportionate history of fell out of crib. Uh, and you can see that, that what we have here is an extraaxial collection in the right frontal lobe. Uh, we can see this high-density material, linear high-density material that's on the left side that's more acute. So this is more of a chronic subdural hematoma. We can also see some blood layering dependently in the occipital horn, consistent with acute injury. And you can see this ischemic injury as well. Children tend to react much more in an ischemic fashion to trauma than, than adults. They just disorder regulate more than adults do. And so you'll see a lot more uh, areas of infarction in uh, pediatric trauma than in adult, in adult trauma. So here's another example showing this, this, this dense cerebellum, some blood layering along the tentorium, and the ischemic area due to diffuse disorder regulation with then transudation of fluid out of the vessels with this kind of diffuse cerebral edema. And of course, other things that you're going to question are, you know, what's the skeletal, what's the skeletal survey showing? Uh, look in their eyes. Uh, is there evidence of retinal hemorrhage? When, when there's a skull fracture, there are a few things that I like to think about. I'm particularly concerned when a fracture overlies a dural sinus because then it can be predispose the patient to dural sinus thrombosis and therefore venous hypertension, and therefore hemorrhagic venous infarcts. I'm concerned when they overlie the middle meningeal artery because of the epidural hematoma right there at the temporal squamosa. If it overlies eloquent, I don't really like this term, but it's in all the books, overlying eloquent cortex, which is sensory motory cort uh, cortex, but you know, all the brain, in my opinion, actually has a say, and, uh, uh, and, uh, but eloquent cortex is defined as that. Depressed. <clears throat> more than one table width uh, is concerning to the neurosurgeons. They'll uplift that. If it's open or compound, in other words, is it going to get infected? So if there's a laceration, a radiopaque foreign body, air in the soft tissues, if it's a compound fracture we're concerned about, if it traverses a sc the skull base, the traverses the internal carotid artery canal, you worry about pseudoaneurysm, vascular dissection, and if it's a temporal bone fracture, because temporal bone fractures have their own set of, of problems. So here's an example. Lateral scalp view shows, and this guy who dove into a, uh, a shallow pool uh, shows on the CT, uh, CT angiogram the depression, but patency of the venous sinus. And so you're concerned about sagittal sinus injury. This is a different patient, but the same kind of injury. Again, a diver, you see some uh, contra-coup uh, hemorrhages of the orbital frontal lobe, right where the olfactory cortex is, so the olfactory bulbs, so 
anosmia is, um, is a problem here, but uh, the displaced fracture more than a table width and the proximity to the satural sinus is, is what we're concerned about in this case. In this case, I'm worried because it's comminuted, it's compound, it's depressed, and it's overlying the sensory motor cortex on this side. So all of these features, there's gas here, it's depressed quite a bit. Um, these, are, these are issues that uh, uh, I worry about. I worry about a fracture when I see opacification of the mastoid air cells, which is the easiest way to identify a temporal bone fracture. Whenever you see asymmetric opacification of the mastoid air cells, look, look for a temporal bone fracture. And similarly, if you see blood in the sphenoid sinus, look for a skull base fracture. And you can see here that the carotid canal, uh, the internal carotid canal is uh, disrupted. You can see the clivus actually has uh, a fracture going right through it. And back then, when this was a case that I had when I was a fellow, back in 1905, I think, and, um, and here you can see that we did angiograms, and uh, we saw this flap, and we saw this disruption of the cavernous portion of the internal carotid artery, and this was just a, a carotid dissection. Now we would likely do a CT angiogram. And why would we do a CT angiogram or an MR angiogram rather than a catheter angiogram? Well, here's actually another example, and, and Max is going to talk about vascular dissection, but I want to show you one example. Here's a beautiful case showing that crescent sign. Okay, now that crescent sign, which is methemoglobin here, is outside the lumen, right? The lumen is preserved, okay? If you look at on these time of flight source images, you can see that the actual caliber of the lumen is preserved. And that's why the angiogram would be negative. So in this case, the catheter angiogram was negative. But we can see outside of this lumen uh, with our cross-sectional images and therefore pick up dissections. Case eight and nine are two different patients that have, a, um, that have had trauma. This patient is dizzy, and this patient can't hear. So what do we see? In this patient, both of them have temporal bone fractures, and in this patient, we see a longitudinal temporal bone fracture, so a fracture that's oriented parallel to the long axis of the petrous bone, and we also see a transverse temporal bone fracture. Just seeing the fracture is one thing. You want to think about, well, what are the fractures traversing? What are they injuring? And here we can see something called a pneumolabyrinth, and that's a air in the vestibule. So these patients are notoriously very dizzy, but often there's other concomitant head injuries that kind of interfere with them, you know, with their dizziness uh, uh, symptoms. But a pneumolabyrinth is something you want to be able to identify. It can be air in the vestibule, it can be air in the cochlea. Okay, and this patient over here has a longitudinal temporal bone fracture, but if you look carefully, which you always should, at the ossicles, you can see there's too much space between the malleus and the uh, incus. So this is incudomalleal dis dislocation. Uh, case number 10, the last case is a, uh, a patient with proptosis. Okay, a lot of features here, a lot of different findings. This patient has a CC fistula. What are all the findings of a CC fistula? Well, you can see here, this is the same patient, that there's proptosis. You can see that the extraocular muscles are enlarged, they're engorged. You can see that the, the ipsilateral cavernous sinus is convex. You can see that there's, uh, if it's bilateral, you, you, both of them are gonna be convex, it can be a little bit more tricky. You want to look for enlargement of the supraophthalmic vein, retrobulbar fat stranding, which is kind of shown just a little bit here. And you wanna think about the brain because what happens to the brain when there's a CC fistula? Well, it depends. It depends on the outflow of that fistula. Uh, but you can get uh, hemorrhagic venous infarcts with uh, a CC fistula as well. So remember the CC fistula, when it's due to trauma, there's dural fistulas and there's traumatic fistulas. And when it's due to trauma, it's a high flow direct shunt. It's a hole in the internal carotid artery that's now turning in that's now f causing blood to get out of that arterialized structure and opens up that that area and flows arterialized blood flow into the cavernous sinus so what you end up with is is blood now going art from the arterial space to the venous space out the different routes of, of venous drainage so the traumatic CC fistula is high flow with a direct hole between the internal carotid artery and the cavernous you look for these for proptosis and the supraophthalmic vein in the cavernous sinus, as I showed. Clinically, these patients may have chemosis or proptosis or even a brewery. Uh, they may have cranial nerve palsy, and they may have decrease in vision. The treatment of a CC fistula is sometimes they'll start with just manual carotid jugular compression. That usually doesn't work, but it, it sometimes does. And it's it's a, this is the case this is a case for the uh, neuro IR folks with balloon or coils or even uh, glue. So here you see just an example of normal cavernous sinus anatomy and all the outflow. 
And on this lateral angiogram, if you get an angiogram, uh, it, it may be, it, it's probably either going to be an angiogram, I mean an aneurysm case, or a fistula case. And here you can see that when you in, inject the internal carotid artery, that you also see the cavernous sinus. And as you know, when you're looking at angiography, you should never see arteries and veins on the exact same film because it's a dynamic phase, right? So you see internal carotid artery opacified, cavernous sinus opacified, superophthalmic vein pacified, internal jugular vein pacified, and then there's this draining vein, which is particularly ominous, that usually warrants emergency treatment uh, because of the potential venous hypertension that, that goes. Here's an example just on MR. You have asymmetric flow voids. Uh, you also can see in this patient the swollen extraocular muscles and the proptosis. And this is an old-fashioned 3D time of flight MRA, MRA that's um, of the circle of Willis. And we have this bow tie flow-related enhancement that shouldn't be there that's outlining the cavernous sinus. So the cases that I've showed you, we talked about subdurals. We talked about if they're heterogeneous, they may be active hemorrhage. They, it may be also... Um, re-bleeding into a pre-existing chronic subdural. Don't forget the isodense subdural. The epidural hematomas, the characteristic anatomic features, especially if there's a low-density area, the so-called swirl sign. The fracture, uh, the, the, the uh, adjectives that are attached to fractures that, that worry me, the CC fistula. Then inside the brain, we talked about the coup, contra coup mechanism, and don't forget including trauma and differential diagnosis of ring-enhancing lesions. Child abuse, of course, is a favorite uh, diagnosis on the boards because it's one of those don't-miss lesions. We mentioned how the uh, disorder regulation is a particularly a problem in children as opposed to adults. And then we also talked about uh, shearing injuries, the triad, grade one, grade two, grade three, the various sequences that are potentially helpful in shearing injury, and keeping DAI in your list of, of multiple uh, hematomas.